So, how was your day? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Um, I want to, I mentioned our partners earlier and I did not mention our sponsors. And so I would love for you to take a look at our sponsorship page because without the sponsors, without the generosity of our sponsors, we wouldn't be here. And so in the program, you have the sponsors. There was a sponsor slide at lunch. I don't know how visible it was, but you'll see that they are Southern Ionics, Southwire, the Cumberland Island Conservancy, the Georgia Coast Atlas Project, Southern Environmental Law Center, Lindsay Thomas Consulting, Rainier Advanced Materials, St. Simon's Land Trust, Blue-Footed Timing, Georgia Conservancy, Kingfisher Paddle Ventures, The Nature Conservancy, South Coast Bank and Trust, University of Georgia Press, Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant for, from the University of Georgia, National Parks Conservation Association, Georgia Water Coalition, Environmental Education Alliance of Georgia, Georgia Association of Marine Educators, Wild Blue Sea, Satilla Riverkeeper, the Trust for Public Land, the 4-H Tidelands Nature Center, Coastal Wildscapes, the Georgia Wildlife Federation, Openings, Heartfulness, the Altamaha Riverkeeper, and the Carrata Research Project. So with their generosity, we have been able to make this event great. And I'm so grateful for their, um, for their participation. So thank you to our sponsors. The second thing I want to remind you is don't forget about your action guide. I hope you've been using it all day. Keep using it. Use it tomorrow throughout your field trips. And then third, please don't forget about the action table. We have had so many letters signed and petition signatures today. Um, so thank you for all of you who have gone by and participated. Thank you for those of you who put your project ideas up on the board. Just please don't forget to stop by because you never know what you'll find. So as we get started to hear Dr. Lanham, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about him. I, um, in preparation for today, I read a little bit about Dr. Nichols and Dr. Lanham. And what I learned about Dr. Lanham is that he is a wildlife ecologist at Clemson University. And like many of us, he spends hundreds of hours a year sitting, watching, and listening to the things that most people never even notice. For Dr. Lanham, it's birds, but it's something else too. Something that many of us, even as we in this room have trained our eye to see the invisible, we overlook some of the things that Dr. Lanham sees. In an essay that Dr. Lanham wrote back in September, he revealed that while birding one day in the Ace Basin in South Carolina, he found himself observing bobolinks. He says that he was as he was observing them, he could not help but think back 200 years to when the little black birds would stop on their way north to feed in the rice fields of the plantations that populated the area. He says, quote, the blackbirds flew and died freely 200 years ago, but, that, but the black people working among them didn't. Dr. Lanham has spent his career sharing his love of birds with others. Through teaching and writing, he has educated thousands of people about something most people overlook or take for granted. But unlike most environmentalists, he also gives a voice to the history that has occurred on the lands that he traverses, that we all traverse, in our observance of nature. By way of an introduction, I want, to see, I want to show you a brief video clip that is a nice example of his work. It is, the footage is taken here on the coast at Little St. Simons, and the clip is an intro into a larger, doctor, into a larger documentary about William Bartram's travels. This particular piece depicts Little St. Simons from a bird's eye view, and we all thought it would be something that you might enjoy. I was a noticer before I was a birder. Oh, see that? See that gate? See that? Look at that. Okay, okay, what do we, oh, oh. Oyster catcher courtship. Noticing birds and how they behave and the peculiar characteristics that each bird has allowed me to be able to feel that bird and identify with it. love affair with birds, I've personalized them. It may not be scientifically correct to do so, but understanding that bird's character, its behavior, its ecological requirements, how it's built for its environment and what it is, give that bird an identity. 
And when I give something an identity, I move from what to who. That doesn't take away from how we know it as scientists. That's not the same thing as anthropomorphizing birds and giving them human qualities. It simply allows me to develop a relationship with that organism, just as I would another human being. One of the connections that we have to birds is this ultimate symbol of freedom in almost defying the very physics that keeps us earthbound. People crave this vicarious escape, this boundless opportunity to experience the earth and dimensions that humans have always wanted to. There's a disconnect from nature in part because we see ourselves somehow as more than the other creatures that we share the world with. The main thing as a human being is that we have responsibilities. And those responsibilities are, are to care for the living things and the land around us in ways that are, that are empathetic. And so it's a golden rule that extends beyond just human to human. It extends to, it extends to nature too. Until we understand that, I think we're on the wrong path. It's a pretty special place. I end up losing time here. Millions, decades, minutes, seconds, and all of it sort of compressed into this poetry that a plover made in a few seconds. It's hard for me to understand how anybody could not love this. If we found ourselves closer to nature, more empathizers than dominators, maybe we'd respect the natural world more. Maybe we would care for it in, in different ways. We'd think about future generations and we would be good neighbors. We would live more sustainably, perhaps. Dr. Lanham is here today to tell you his story. I know that after you hear him speak, you will, your perspective on nature will be changed in a better, more holistic way forever. Thank you. And thank you, Megan, for those, for those kind words. Uh, I must tell you that, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm, I can claim Georgia because I was born in Augusta. So that's, that's my first claim. But then there's a deeper, a deeper claim that I have here and, and one that, um, that initially escaped me on my, my trip down, even though I know this history. It's, it's one that, that I had sort of overlooked. And so um, last night I stayed in Charleston as the, as the rain kept me from coming down and I was lamenting a little bit because I always, I want to catch as many sunrises and sunsets as I can. Each one of those is an artwork. It's a masterpiece that's laying down on landscapes differently. And so I stayed there last night, and as I drove down with a 2 o'clock wake up, 2 a.m. wake up this morning, drove down to get to the hotel, and I immediately asked, where do I go and watch the sunrise? And the kind person said, well, there's a boardwalk out there, and there's the beach. You're there. And so I go out, and I'm standing there in the dark, and I'm listening to the waves roll in stereo, it's just very dim light painting the horizon. A brown pelican cruises by. And then I remembered 1858. I remembered 1858 because that was the year that the slave ship Wanderer, a slave yacht, brought the last 
illegal importation of enslaved Africans that we know of into North America. November 28th was the date, and on that date there were there was a cargo that was being chased in by a frigate because it was illegal. It had been forbade in 1805. And so here this yacht out of New York is bringing in this sad cargo. And as it's being chased in, it disembarks on Jekyll Island, Georgia. Some of those enslaved were quickly bought and sold into Alabama, Florida, and West. A few, however, were sold up the Savannah River and ended up on a plantation in Edgefield, South Carolina. One of those enslaved came to be known as Lucy Lanham. Lucy Lanham was three years old when she disembarked on the sands that I would like to think somehow bear the same molecules, maybe blood, sweat, certainly probably tears, that my ancestors did. And so standing on that beach this morning waiting for the sun to rise was an experience for me that I will, that I will never forget. And so I'm very thankful, grateful to 100 Miles, to Catherine, to Megan for, for having me here in this place because I could see home from here. So today, I'd like to, I mean, there have been so many great conversations, and that's what this is about. There have been so many great conversations about conservation. And that's a bit of a tongue twister, but I, I want you to, to reduce, if you can, conservation to this very simple equation. Conservation is caring about something enough intensely enough that you want to save some for later. Now, move that intensity another level. You want to save something for later for others. So, saving something for later for others, intensely, I can define conservation as love. So, I operate off that premise. Dr. Nichols talked about it earlier. It's an equation that, that we all know and that we should all be familiar with. But today, I, I really want to share with you just some thoughts on, on who we are, who I believe 100 miles to be, who you are here as conservationists, as carers, as lovers, lovers of the land. So Megan introduced me as a bird brain. That's, <laughs> that's OK. <laughs> that's, I, look. Um, any creature that can half sleep its brain, sleep flying on the wing, fly for years at a time, find its way from Tierra del Fuego to the Arctic and back again with a built-in GPS never having to ask someone sitting in the side seat <laughs> or being told where to go. Those are miraculous creatures. So as a little boy, I looked scoured for, for my inspiration. So what I'm asking you to do today, I'm asking you to wander with me. I'm asking you to wander with me. You've wandered all day. You've had these conversations surrounding our love of the land, our love of this Georgia coast, the 100 miles. And I want you to expand beyond that 100 miles. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to evoke something. I want you to bring something back that makes you think of what you looked to, whom you looked to for inspiration. You'll see in many of the pictures that roll by you, you'll not only see the faces of birds, you'll not only see the faces of forests and swamps and trees, you'll see the faces of people. And you won't just see the faces of people and beasts and places from here, you'll see them from around the world, but you'll notice that they always come back to my south. They come back to this place where I was born, where I was reared. So I did a little bit of research. And to me, mission is important. Conservation is a mission. It's a mission of love. It's a mission of caring. And so I looked at the 100 miles mission, and it says, your mission is to preserve, to protect, and enhance Georgia's 100-mile coast. 
You envision a future where coastal Georgia has thriving communities, protected landscapes, and secure wildlife. That's an affirmative statement. That's an action statement. Really, it sums up to you love Georgia's coast enough to protect them. I want you envisioning love, loving Georgia's coast beyond the 100 miles. Yes, you are conservationists. Many of you work for local agencies. You may work for state agencies, federal nonprofits. Maybe you don't work at all. Maybe you volunteer. You give your time, you give your talent, you give resources. Some of you give blood, some of you give sweat and tears to efforts. But I'd like for you to think about the nature and nurture of who it is that we are. The labels that we put on ourselves. I want you to think about who you are. I want you to think about who encourages you. You know, we've heard stories today of support, of who makes us who we are, who brings us to this point of love and care. I want you to think about who engages you. I want you to know that just as natural resources demand stewardship, so do we. So do we. And that is a matter of connection. Rachel Carson wrote, those who contemplate the beauty of the earth find reserves of strength that will ensure as long as life lasts. There is something infinitely healing in the repeated refrains of nature, the assurance that dawn comes after night and spring after winter. So who you are is carers, you are lovers. I think about why we do what we do, and it's not just who inspires us, is it what nature supplies us, it's air and water and soil and wildlife. You are the who, though, who makes the connections between nature and nurture. You are the who that bridges rich and poor and black and white and brown and urban and rural and white and generational millennials to X, to Y, to I, and gender, non-gender designation. You are the who that encourages and engages and empowers. The what is our soil, the what is our water, the what is our air, the what is our wildness that winds its way from northern Appalachian Mountain through Piedmont here to Georgia coast and Atlantic Ocean. The where has been defined, it's 100 miles, but I would ask us to expand beyond that. The when is pretty simple. The when is the past, it is understanding our connections to culture that have impacted our landscapes, as Megan mentioned, my constant thinking about where it is that we are. What's influenced this landscape? I have to share with you that frequently I take birding groups out in the low country of South Carolina and we're watching all manner of birds, black ducks and wood storks and white pelicans and bald eagles and tundra swans, and we're watching all of these on these old rice fields. And we're watching one day and someone comments about the extraordinary job that our Department of Natural Resources has done in creating these landscapes. I took my binoculars down for a second, and we began to have a conversation. And just as the presence of Lucy and her first steps in this foreign land came to me, all of a sudden I began to imagine, began to wonder about those people on the land, thigh deep in pluff mud, working tasks, to create grains of rice that would make some of the richest people in this country. And I began to tell the story of the Seven Mile Ditch. I began to tell the story of this Seven Mile Ditch that's three men wide and two men deep. And I began to tell the story of the mule in the ditch. And I began to tell the story of moving soil so that water could be run off of this land so that the rice could grow. And I began to tell the story of somehow the mules that would sink into the mud so that they died and that people would too. 
and the birds cried. And a few of us did too. And all of the sudden, all of the sudden, the who, the what, the when, and the where was transfigured from that present to 300 years before. And giving the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources proper credit saying, now we are managing what the past has built. But understanding that there were people here who were aware that maybe saw the green and gold of Carolina parakeets flash before their eyes, that maybe heard a double rap call in deep, deep big timber, that perhaps had the skies darkened by passenger pigeons at one time. But they watched these birds in a different context, but they knew these birds. I sometimes wonder about Harriet Tubman hearing black rails on the Cumbie. And so that context gives us reason to expand time. It gives us reason to expand beyond 100 miles. And so when I say the when is simple, it's the past that informs our present that certainly determines our future. I see the time as spring migration and birds returning. It is the autumnal turn and the same reversal for the spring. It is full moon and high tides. It is rising sea levels and intensifying storms that will continue no matter who is in denial. It is connecting the thread of time through places that are stitched together by oyster catchers and skimmers, sandpipers and willets and turnstones and black ducks and gray ducks and greenheads and spoonbills and wood storks. It is all of it tied together with the air and water and wind that we all need, all of us, human-skinned, bird-feathered, and fish-finned, all of it connected to make sense and relevance that we work to protect this world, this 100 miles of Georgia coast that means so much more than the distance would ever tell. More of the why? Cumberland, Little Cumberland, Jekyll, St. Simon, Sea Island, Little St. Simon, Sapelo, Blackbeard, St. Catharines, Ossabaw, Wausau, and Tybee, Little Tybee. Add to those 13 names the names of all the birds and beasts you know. Add to those names then all the people you know who live, all the people who breathe. Multiply those numbers then by degrees of happiness, however you define happiness and well-being, wherever you can find it, and economic sustenance and ecological sustainability. And that, my friends, is your why. So who, what, why, when, where? Those are basic questions that are often posed to us. And as conservationists, I think we need to be able to tell people that they understand that nature is not some faraway place, but here, impacting us. But ultimately, where we are here impacts the rest of the world. The data tells us so. So, as we've addressed these basic questions within the past few years, I'm a college professor, spent a lot of my time gathering data doing the science, publishing the science. But within the past few years, I've given fewer and fewer what I call p-value presentations, where statistics and methodological details would most likely numb all of you to a pudding-like consistency. <laughs> you ever seen pudding nod? It's not pretty. I think that perhaps all of us should step back from the scary cliff edge we've carved and take stock. No, I'm not asking any of you to unstake from the data proven claims. I'm not asking any of you to discount the science that tells us climate change is real, that habitat loss is happening, or any other critical issue that we are concerned with. And no, I'm not suddenly some academic apoplectic who's railing against the science that I know drives the machine. But what I have become is desensitized and denatured and somewhat depressed at what seems sometimes to be a hopeless case. 
I took the time once <laughs> to look into the eyes of my students as I lay out the case for whatever conservation cause. Actually, I look into the eyes of my students quite a bit. I think it freaks them out. <laughs> but I look into their eyes and I don't often see hope. Because we spend day after day talking about all that's wrong, and there is a lot that's gone wrong, but there are success stories that, to tell. There are personal stories of triumph that we can tell about ourselves, that we can tell about the wildlife that we watch and that we care for. I would ask you, do you ever take the time to look deep into the eyes of the people you're supposed to reach? And so I sometimes have to ask the question, are we inspiring hard work and hope or dooming the future? I'd like for you to think about it. If we spend all of this time talking about what's wrong, and Dr. Nichols talked about it this morning, we've talked about it in the back room, we've talked about who it is that we are as conservationists. Remember that first question, who are we? Why did we get into this in the first place? Really, would you come, as Dr. Nichols said, would you join the club if you knew that it was all about doom and gloom? I don't know. I don't see a whole lot of goth dress out here. Not to say that we don't welcome goth, all right? But let's think about why you do what you do. What is the wonder that pulls you in? What moves your heart to beat a little faster, your spirit to soar? That's the good news. And I think sometimes we lose that in all of the mire of the bad. A little bit about me. I, you know, some of you came of age at the same time that I did in the 80s. That was a, a trying time. The fat boys, the cars, the police, parachute pants, members only jackets, Bartles and James. Those are wine coolers. <laughs> Lots of parties. But there was also the advent of the 24 hour news cycle and suddenly you could turn on the news and see huge swaths of rainforest raised to the ground and set ablaze to make sure the supply of Big Macs kept flowing. And then right after that news story, I could see the injustice of apartheid, grisly pictures of people being bullied and beaten and burned. And then there was the Secretary of the Interior, um, this guy named James Watt, who threatened to wipe out many endangered species from the American landscape simply by sort of renaming them. So this was a slow drain on my psyche. Anybody ever feel that? You feel the slow drain. So what fuels you? If you're constantly being drained, how do you have enough fuel to go forward to care about this 100 miles of Georgia coast or anything beyond it? Where do we find the good news? We fast forward to now and there's not just one channel spewing the constant sludge of what just happened or what some so-called expert thinks will happen. There are hundreds of them. Combine that with the social media feeds and the assault today is even worse. Are we truly more informed? Are we really more enlightened in the constant crush of it all? Maybe again, I'm not eschewing the data at all. I'm just asking us to turn down the volume and listen to the inner machine that's hopefully always on. This is the inner machine that lubs and dubs and pumps the seawater through our veins. I want us to understand who we truly are and have the capacity to be more than bemoaners of the bad. Talking is the first step in acting to make things better. Beyond it, we must close our mouths, open our hands, and act. So nowadays, I find myself more and more taking the hard data, the science, and wrapping it in some inspiration and caring. Again, the science is critical. That's always first. I want folks to understand that the science 
in many ways is the scripture of what we do. It's the basis for what we have to do to go forward. But then there's that action, the mission work that I've talked about, that intensity of caring for something enough that you want to save something for others for later. The peer-reviewed words without caring works behind them fill library shelves, but birds and beasts will suffer if we don't push for more. We need to speak from our heads and our hearts now. The voice is what connects the two. I call it connecting the conservation dots, and that motivation comes from deep within. It's E.O. Wilson's biophilia exercise to become action beyond instinct. Head to heart and out to every soul that will loosen the logical locks and fling open the doors. There's an interconnectedness between all of us, between every living thing that should move us all. I say it from somewhere deeper than any place a published paper could ever reach. If I had the voice, I would sing it in tripartite harmonic as a wood thrush would. Aldo Leopold's admonitions to keep all the parts, to be one of those who cannot live without wild things, to listen to the mountain, to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the Baotic community, fly round and round inside me. Those words are like migrating flocks of swifts. These days I shake hands less and give hugs more. I exchange more heartbeats now than business cards. The work now is mission. I can no longer limit God to three letters. I expand the role of the unknown, the inexplicable, the mysterious to inquiry and questing left yet to do. That's called job security for those of us who wander and wonder. I would rather be baptized in black water and communion with scuppernong wine and chorus with songbirds in a temple of soil, sky, and trees. I think we should be moving into a space where this mission becomes more evident to those that we serve. For me, I've settled into a comfortable place with the idea of nature and God being the same thing. Heaven may be an old field where the old buck beds or the hidden marsh pond where the gray ducks drop in to the decoy spread. Evolution and gravity are the constants. Change in the dynamic nature of an old field growing into forests moves me. A long bill curlew migrating over hundreds of miles of land to find refuge once again on the same spot of pluff is as miraculous to me as any dividing sea. Our sin is in not noticing these things. We repent by going outside. Backsliding isn't a bad thing on marsh tide. It isn't about beating fear or shame into people, but rather sharing passions. I would like to think that doing good things for nature and revering it is no less a just act than being humane and just to other human beings. As we approach this weekend, as we are in this weekend, as we approach the King holiday, the day on, not a day off, I would like to offer that service on behalf of nature, that air and water, that clean air, that clean water, that secure land is as much inalienable and civil a right as any. In the moments of confession that I have in front of strangers talking about love of something much greater than any one of us, I become the dream, a freer me. People I've never met of all colors become kindred. My wild heart and nature-loving soul are bared for all to see. Each time is rebirth for me. John Muir once said that when one tugs at a single thing in nature, he finds it attached to the rest of the world. So let's think about our state of connectedness. I would like for each of you to imagine yourselves then as dots, islands in the stream of human consciousness, but connected by the will to do good for wildness. Each of you are unique in some aspect of your dottedness. 
That's where the inclusion, that's where the diversity comes in. It's important that we be able to see that. It's important that we be able to reach different communities of people as the demographic and the world changes. But it is also important to recognize what is inside you, that you bring your ideas, that you bring your passion, that you bring that diversity to be included in the conversation. My challenge then to you is to embrace the treasures around you as the mission calls for. I ask you to hear the Wimbrel's call. I ask you to watch a flock of Dunlin twist and turn in murmuration's reverie. Skitter and chase the surf like a sanderling. Sit in a marsh blind before the world wakes and hear the marsh hens plan the day ahead. Pop Dr. Nichols' Blucebo. I'm going to get some of those. Know that what you work to protect here is more than just 100 miles of coastline. It is legacy and vision that will benefit countless souls that fly, swim, skitter, crawl, and those of us that walk or wheel. It is tied tick tight to love. It is tied tightly to care. It is who each and every one of us are. Those elemental questions, those essential questions of who, what, when, where, and why lie within each. Love and care stretching limitless distances beyond 100 miles is our mission going forward. I'll share this piece that, um, that I wrote called Sound Thinking. The ocean gives and takes by time and tide, creates and destroys with each surge, lapping away at the edge of what we know. I'm picking at leftovers, scavenging, sharing surf with sandpipers and turnstones, plundering plovers, treasuring things the abyss didn't want. The birds find morsels of muscle and invisible things buried in the sand. I scan the broken bits of aliens sent asunder by storms. Constellations of fallen starfish, moon snails, angels' wings. All ripped from reef and rack, empty houses, the deep dispossessed lie strewn along the strand. A hermit repossesses the foreclosure, scuttles away with the deal, tucks away in security dealt by death. It is sure in the uncertainty each wave washes to and fro. It is sheltered by some confidence that I don't possess. Instead, I saunter along the daily disaster dealt from the deep, hoarding truth into pockets, holding shards of sunlight in a memory already full, thinking too much about what is, maybe wanting what isn't, lacking a hiding hole or a shell strong enough to see me through. I exist exposed on some intertidal plane. I live naked in between high water wishes and low water wants. Unbalanced on the shifting of should and should not, a gull hangs in the wind and simply laughs at my decision to just be. So you know a little about me, I hope to learn more about you. Remembering that conservation is simply the intensification of care, to move beyond this 100 miles, to save some for others for later. Thank you so much for having me back in this place where I can see home again. I look forward to meeting with each one of you somehow later. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lanham. That was a wonderful presentation. Okay, I have four things to say. First, when you walk outside the door, there will be a bar. But you have to listen to the other three things before you do that. 
Second, from five to six, we will have book sales and signing. So you can purchase the books that we have here and, and the authors that are here will sign them. From six to 7.30 or so, we will be celebrating our 100 Miles 100 recipients. So please feel free to stay for that. Third, something is there when nothing else is that isn't there when anything else is. Dr. Lanham said that conservation is loving something enough to save it for someone else. Fourth, let's go out and save it together. Thank you for being here.